Today we're going to talk about something pretty specific and then I'm going to show you a couple of games that sort of have to do with that, but not necessarily, um, but, but they do. And then the reason I'm showing it to you is because it's the under 1400 class, so it's something that happens to you a lot. Now, you all know Bugs Bunny, obviously, right? Yes. Okay, good answer. And w one of the funniest lines in Bugs Bunny history has to do with chess. I'm sure you all know that. Also has nothing to do with chess. And he, the abominable snowman is going to kill him. And so Bugs Bunny tricks him by asking him, what are the distinguishing characteristics of an abominable snowman? Confusing the snowman. And while the snowman's confused, Bugs Bunny escapes. So I do this in chess a lot because in chess, we also have distinguishing characteristics because although not necessarily in TV or movies, but in theory, the chessboard is always set up the same way. Although, when I did get to the chess center, the outside chess set was set up wrong. Okay, but it should be set up this way, and usually engines and computers and programs set it up right. Because of that, the same things happen all the time. And also because of that, when they invented Chess 960, they had a lot of rules to make sure the distinguishing characteristics were the same. And one of those rules is your bishops have to be on different colors. So if you watch a Chess 960 game, I'm sure you all play Chess 960. Yeah. Have you ever played Chess? Ever? Yeah? Okay. And, and, and one of the rules is the bishops have to be on different colors. One has to be red and one green. Okay. Now, because of this, when we do opening analysis, which I'm sure you guys do every day, you see the same thing over and over again. This makes it easy to remember. Well, easier. Now, Here's the three things you have to know about the opening, and none of you know the third one. That's why you might lose in the opening. First one you have to know is the general principles of chess. So even if there's no opening theory, because I'm making it up, one side is following the general principles of chess, and the other side is not. Okay? And so uh, which side has the advantage? Obviously, it's white, yeah. because white's following several principles that you've already learned before the class, and black is playing like some kid who comes to our chess camp, probably like one of the stronger kids. Okay. Now, if I turn on the engine, and I say, what's the evaluation? Does it say it's equal because the material's equal, or does it say white's winning because black's play makes no sense? White's winning? It says white's winning. Right. So it'll say something like plus three? Okay. Something like plus three. I don't know. I don't know. I never I made this position up. Well, leave me alone. Okay. So it says even more than plus three. It says that white is the equivalent of more than a piece ahead because black is breaking all these principles and white's playing correctly. Okay. And even beginners, once you talk to them for like 10 minutes, they can. I mean, I'm not saying that they will stop doing that, but they could. They don't. I tell them to play like white, and they still play like black, but, I mean, I told them. They just didn't listen. Okay. And the reason is, when a beginner learns chess before I teach them, they just, they always do the same nonsense, and they won't stop. Like, I can't stop them. But you can see that white's already winning. Okay. So you know that. Now, then, you guys get confused because... You play with the general principles, and you're completely losing. And you're like, I did everything you told me to do, and the computer says I'm lost. Okay? And the reason that happens is more important than general principles is concrete analysis. So, for example, in this position, if you follow a general principle of developing your bishop to the center, that loses your bishop, and you're like, why did I lose my bishop? I, I did what he said I'm supposed to do. I, I played, I, I'm playing in the center developing my pieces, okay? Well, it's more important in chess to not give your pieces away. So that actually has to do with calculation. If you don't see one move ahead, and you always see zero moves ahead, you're going to lose a lot. If you see one move ahead, and your opponent sees two moves ahead, you're going to lose a lot, and so forth. And that's why the best players in the world see further ahead than you do, okay? And you guys might even know the principles as well as they do, but you guys are always giving pieces away and they don't because they see more moves ahead than you do. 
That was a very simple example, but like equally simple to me would be some kind of fork that wins a piece. So by cheating a little bit and changing the move order, okay, so I do this. And in this position after queen e7, you'll notice it's check because I said so, right? Yes. Okay. And so you're like, well, I'm in check and I'm playing with the general principles and my opponent is not. I developed my bishop and my opponent developed his queen before his other minor pieces and he blocked his bishop. So you're like, that's a bad move because of general principles. Okay? And in fact, I just got a text before the class. You guys don't know this because I just got it. There's no more general principles because Trump fired him. It's the, it's the latest of the generals that he fired. Yeah. Can you believe that, Trudy? Uh, no. Darn. Okay. So let's say white follows the general principles and plays, let's say, 92. Then white can castle and white just got his knight out. Okay. Another way you could follow the general principles is bishop to e3, which also loses. Okay. And we'll play 92. Now black is winning. Even though black doesn't follow the general principles and white does, black is winning. What's the winning move? Queen, queen b4. Queen b4 check. Okay, that's check, and it attacks the bishop. So black saw one or two moves ahead, depending on your point of view, and white saw zero. If I, if I say, hey, you with white, did you see queen b4 check? What are they going to say? No. no, I didn't see that. And then they lost their bishop, and they're mad at me if I'm their coach, because they're like, you told me to get my bishops and knights out and not move my queen, and I moved my bishops and knights out, and my opponent moved his queen, and he beat me. Okay, more important than general principles is not giving all your pieces away, but I would like to thank you, because I've played some of you before, and you give your pieces away, and I take them. Thank you. Okay. Very nice of you. Right? Okay. Exactly. Okay, so... In this position, white should play queen e2. That does not lose a piece. If you're taking notes, not losing a piece is better than losing a piece. Unless you're playing, you. you're playing me. There's the guy who's, yeah, there you go. Now you're making sense. Okay. Now, then that's the second thing. So the first thing is general principles. The second thing is, are you giving your pieces away or you're not giving your pieces away? You guys are pretty good at both of those. You're good at giving your pieces away. You're good at not giving your pieces away. You're good at general principles. The third one, none of you are good at. And I'm a little good at it, but I'm not as good as the best players in the world. But I'm, a, I'm, I'm okay. I'm better than you. But you know, I'm, not, I'm not the world's leading authority. The third thing is preparation. Okay? You know what's going to happen before you go to the chessboard. You're like, yeah, yeah, I know this. So you're like, I'm playing the general principles and I'm not losing my pieces and the computer says I'm completely losing. Well, why is that? The answer is your opponent has preparation and you have no preparation, okay? And I saw this with one of my students. Let me show you what I saw. It's not what I wanna talk about, but that's, that's why it's extemporaneous. So in this position, this is a Carol Khan, okay. If I, if I push reference this button here, it's gonna tell me all the grandmaster and international master and master games in this position. You think there's gonna be 10 games or 10,000? 10, 10,000. Right, probably 20,000. Okay, and here, the most common move is H4. And if you're like, uh, how do I know to play that move? And the answer is because you've analyzed this position before the game started and you noticed all the grandmasters play h4. And you looked at 500 games and you memorized them and now you beat everybody. That's what a grandmaster does. You guys are like, hmm, what is this opening? And some of you are like, oh, that's the Carol Khan. And some of you are like, what's the Carol Khan? Okay, and then you play a grandmaster and he's like, let me show you 50 games from this position. And you're like, ugh, because now they're gonna beat you, right? Because they know everything and you're like, what is this? Well, I have a student who's rated 1450. He can't even come to this class, he's too good. And he knew that this was a known thing 
And then that he that it was it. He was white, and he's like, okay, it's my move. Now, this is why if you're playing somebody really high rated and you're like scratching your head, why did I lose in 10 moves? It's because they know everything about those 10 moves and you've never seen it before. So if you study chess 10 hours a day and you're like, I'm always playing E4 and when my opponents play the Karo Khan and we get this position, here's what I'm gonna do. But most of you were like, okay, it's move five. That's all I know, I don't know anything else. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, if you're gonna play the most common moves in chess, and then you're like, okay, it's move four, that's all I know. And your opponent's like, I know to move 15 in every variation. Well, they're gonna beat you probably. So what I like to do, if I'm playing somebody who has a lot of knowledge, they know all these openings, I make up my own opening. Then they know nothing, and I know nothing, and then we see who plays better chess, right? So for example, I'm playing somebody who knows a thousand variations of the Karo Khan, and all they play is the Karo Khan. And then I play B3, and they think for three minutes. They know zero. And now we just play chess, and hopefully I'm better than them. Okay, I'm not trying to have a memory competition. Now, unfortunately, and I don't understand why, every beginner in the United States, and probably the world, but I only know the United States, every game goes like this. If you go to a chess camp, and there's kids there, I can show you like half the game is to move seven. And a lot of games go like this. Yeah. Okay, a lot of games go, go like this. Okay, and if you were in a Grandmaster tournament, all the famous Grandmaster tournaments you've heard of, which isn't many for most of you, maybe Raj, okay? You know how many times this position has occurred? Zero. There's no Grandmaster games in this position. However, if you're at a kid's chess camp or a scholastic tournament, it's every game. They're like, I got my pieces out and I castled. Okay, now we're gonna go back and tell you why grandmasters don't do that. Obviously, that's not very exciting. Okay, now there's a snooker player that you've never heard of. Do you know why you never heard of him, Shruti? Because you haven't heard of any snooker players, right? Yes. His name's Steve Davis. And actually, he was not only the best snooker player in the world, at one point, he was the president of the English Chess Federation. He's probably a B player, an A player at chess. I mean, probably. And when I was living in Europe, before you were all born, uh, I watched snooker on TV because I lived in Europe, and Steve Davis won every tournament. And then later, I found out he was a chess guy. I was like, he plays chess. And the reason I'm telling you this long, boring story, there was a chess book that came out, and I opened the chess book, and a British guy wrote the chess book, and the foreword of the book was written by Steve Davis. And he said, when I was a kid, I played chess. And then I gave up chess because chess was too boring because this was every game I ever played. And I didn't want to play chess anymore. If you thought chess was boring, play snooker. Then, okay. All right. Now, let's go back and explain why grandmasters don't do any of that. Okay. So, in a lot of openings you would like to play e4 and then d4. Then you would have the center, right? Yeah. Some of you would play d4, then e4. You could play d4, and after a5, I would probably play e4. However, when you play d4 or e4, your opponent usually doesn't let you play the other one. Usually. You play e4, and you're like, I want to play d4 next to move. The two most common moves try to prevent that. E5, which we're going to talk about today, and C5. If they don't play E5 or C5, if they play the other two common moves, E6 and C6, then white plays D4. If you play D4, what are the two most common moves for black? D5, D5 and Knight F6. Knight F6. And those moves both stop E4. If you play some other move, like you're a bad player, then E4. I turn the engine on, it says white's better. Okay, so when you play E4, and your opponent plays E5, which is almost every beginner on earth, you don't have to give up on D4. In fact, a lot of grandmasters play D4 right away. They play your favorite opening, scotch. the scotch. Now, if you're a little kid, 
or you're a low-rated player, now you have to play a gambit because kids and low-rated players love gambits. So if white plays this move or this move, you know what I know? I know one thing. I only know one thing. They're not a grandmaster. Grandmasters play knight takes d4. Every grandmaster in the world plays knight takes d4. However, if you're at a tournament where the players are your ratings, that's not the most common move. The most common move is either bishop c4 or c3. We have to sacrifice material. I don't know why it's a sacrifice material, but you guys must think so. Now, after the move bishop c4, which is very funny, it used to be the most popular at scholastic tournaments, and all the grandmasters played here. And now the grandmasters are playing here again. We're back to the 1800s for some reason. Well, the reason obviously is the Berlin. Okay. Okay, and then bishop c5. Now, I know a guy in Chicago. He's the most hated man in Chicago, and that's saying something. If you tried to be the most hated person in Chicago, you, wouldn't, you couldn't do it. You can't do it. But he did it. Okay? I know somebody who doesn't hate anybody, and he hates that guy. Yeah, That's all true, by the way. If only Spencer was here to nod his head. Okay. And he's a chess coach. And he tells his kids, he's like, look, kids, if you go here, they're going to play 9g5. And then you're going to panic, and you're going to lose. Has anybody had this position before? Yes. And did white always win? Yes. Yeah, right. Why don't, if you go to a scholastic tournament and I see this position, I pick up my phone, I call Vegas, and I bet on white. In a scholastic tournament, white wins. Okay? White's not winning, but in a scholastic tournament, white wins. So he tells his kids, don't do that. Play bishop c5. Then when they play knight g5, you take it. Should they play knight g5? No. No, but some of them do anyway. Okay. Now, most of his opponents, his kids' opponents, castle, knight f6, and now we're ready to castle. Whenever your opponent can play knight g5, if it's legally possible to do so, you should castle. And now the computer will say black is better because white's play doesn't make any sense. Okay. So in a kid's tournament, what happens is white always castles and plays knight c3, and plays d3, and we just looked at that, and then everybody falls asleep, then they quit chess and play snooker. Okay, grandmasters don't do that. Grandmasters want to play d4. I told you you want to play e4 and d4. If you play d4 now, you lose a pawn. Now, let's pretend you went to the grocery store. Who went to the grocery store today? I did. Okay, now, do I eat chicken? No. No, but let's say I did and I bought a chicken from the frozen food section. You got that? Would I be eating it on the way home? No. What would I do? How do you eat chicken when you buy it in the frozen food section? Thaw it. What? Thaw it. Thaw it, cook it, make it so you don't die by eating it, and then eat it when you're not gonna die. You probably die anyway. Okay, in chess, if you wanna play D4, but you can't play D4, you thaw it, you cook it, then you play D4. What move can I play? Or I can play d4. It's a preparatory move. It's like I'm putting it in the oven. What do I do? Anybody? Anyone can answer. C3. Now, now I can play d4. Okay. So grandmasters, a lot of them play c3. Grandmasters don't play knight c3 because then you can't play c3 and d4. Then they play d4 next move. And in fact, I don't have this position very often. However, after the Rui Lopez, I play here and bishop c5 when I'm black. I've had black in this position a lot. And my opponents usually play c3 because they want to play d4. Okay, if you don't play c3 and you don't play d4, the computer says it's equal. If you play d4, maybe you get an advantage. Maybe. Okay. Now, unfortunately, I had some other kids tell me the same thing happened to them. The coach in Chicago who says, go here, that way they can't play there, about half the time, I'm sorry, Bishop C4, about half the time, his kids forget. And they play here, and they're like, oh, I wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> right? I was supposed to play Bishop C5. Okay. So then, he's like, when you forget to play Bishop C5, and this happens, I want you to play a move your opponent doesn't know. And that move is this. 
And also, I don't know that move. So that, I guess nobody knows that move. Okay, that move's very confusing, right? Okay. If you take the knight, then the fork, obviously. And you could take this with the knight or with the bishop. Which one's better? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't analyzed this. Knight. Right. But if you analyze this and you have a lot, you could show me your analysis and the pages you wrote. Right. That's the idea is you're like, what's that? And he actually looks at this with them. He's like, if you forget to play bishop c5, let me show you this variation. Now when he plays knight e4, the other kids with the white pieces are like, what move is that? I never saw that. Now they're confused and his kids are not confused. Okay. So he's a good coach. He's like, when you forget what I told you to do, now you're going to forget this move. Now we'll look at that move. Right. Okay, you. He doesn't teach d5 in the proper way. No, no, because then his, the, the white would know that. Yeah, I understand what he's doing. Yeah, he, d5 is the correct move, but that's beyond the scope of our lecture. Okay, although that is our lecture. Now, after bishop to c5, c3, which is a common move, knight f6, grandmasters today play the move d3 okay and they're going to play d4 later when they feel like it and they're not going to play knight c3 they're going to move their knight around here and get their knight here then they'll play knight f5 and mate you or or they'll play d4 later after they've castled much later okay you can play d4 let's play d4 now now if you play d4 now that's fine. And that was the most common move in the 1800s until about 1920, I guess. Then they were like, all right, we've analyzed D4. We have 2,000 games and White's not getting anything. Let's try something else. And now, in the last five years, um, Grandmasters are castling. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll play D4 later, C3 later. Like, I'm just going to castle. Okay. Now, when you play d4 and you don't castle, I'm not saying that that's bad, but now you're going to get put in check. Now, I had this position yesterday, but I have a good excuse. I was doing a 12-hour stream, so I had every position. I had all chess positions, and I got a call from the grave of Claude Shannon. He said, well done. Right? You, you agree, Shruti? Mm, sort of. Sort of. Yeah, I agree. Okay. And my opponent played bishop b6. Boo! Yeah. I mean, good for me. Okay. And now white has a great position. The reason you trade on d4, if you have the black pieces, is you can play bishop b4 check. And you're like, why are you doing that? Well, because this pawn's attacked. So the guy's in check and his pawn's attacked. If you're going to play bishop b6, which my opponent did, then you, you shouldn't take this pawn because that gets rid of the c3 pawn for the e5 pawn. What's more important, white having a pawn on c3 or black having a pawn on e5? White having a pawn on c3? I'll give you one more guess. The other one? Right, the other one. Yeah. That's a center pawn. That pawn's awesome. We played that on move one. This pawn on c3, whoa, helps me play the move d4. Well, I thought it did, but then I lost everything. Uh, okay. But the pawn on c3 is blocking my knight. I can't play knight c3. And when I have white in any opening and I play c3, like the c3 Sicilian, the advanced French, this one, other ones, I can't play knight c3. So I want to play d4, but I guess I can't play knight c3. And you're like, no, 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 no. You can play knight c3. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, great. So I won the game. I think I won in like 13 moves I made at him. Because not only did I get my center, but I played knight c3. So I got everything. Okay, and what you're supposed to do is play bishop check, and then you're supposed to try to take this pawn. And theory says equal, 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 because white has a nice center, but black's going to take it. Okay, and actually white can play bishop d2 or knight c3 here. Knight c3 was played 150 years ago, and now they play bishop to d2. But they're both about equal. Okay. Now I want to go back and show you something. When my opponent plays the Ruy Lopez and plays c3 and d4, I've had this position a, a billion times. Okay. I've had this position a lot. And this position, 
Do I play bishop b6 or do I take on d4? Bishop b6. Bishop b6. Because if I take on d4, that, that, that's not check. When they castle, you don't take on d4. When they haven't castled, take on d4 and play bishop b4 check. My opponent yesterday in the blitz game, he captured and didn't play bishop b4 check. He was my favorite opponent ever. Okay, that game didn't last very long. Okay, so he, he took and played here. Now, the most famous game ever played started like this. What game was that? You guys know lots of games, right? That's why your ratings are all 3,000. Because when you played a tournament, you're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna replay this game and I'm gonna meet everybody. Right, Trudy? Yes. Yeah. So what game started like this? The opera game. Not the opera game. You just named a famous game. Good job. Can you name any other game? That's the only game you can name. That's it? Nobody can name any games? Does anybody know the opera game, the one he's talking about? Yes. Karen memorized the opera game about two years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does she remember it? Nobody knows. She knows. Okay, what's one of my favorite games? I've lectured on it every week for the last three years. I mean, the opera game was a good guess. Yeah, Steinitz von Bartelaben from what tournament? It's, uh, Hastings or something? Hastings, 1895. And this game has a very long, complicated story. Possibly the greatest game ever played. Definitely the most interesting because it has a really cool thing that happened that I guess most of you don't know. Um, but the story is the guy you never heard of, von Bartelaben. This was round 10, and before this round, he had no losses. Then he lost, and then the tournament was like 22 rounds, and the rest of the tournament, he had no wins. This tournament crushed him psychologically, and then you never heard of him. The guy who won the game, he was world champion for about 27 years. Okay, so winning is good, right? Okay. Yes. And that game went bishop b4 check, knight c3, and black already made a mistake. Now, Black had a good excuse. It was 1895. He didn't have a bookshelf with 500 chess books, and he didn't have three laptops to analyze the opening with. I'm not sure why he didn't have that stuff. Okay. You know why, Shruti? No. It was 1895. They didn't have any of that. Okay? okay. Now they have that. Okay. And in this position, Black can take a pawn. If this game was played today, Black would take that pawn. But von Bartleben played d5. So he let white do everything he wanted and didn't take that pawn. And now white's not down a pawn. Great. This knight's not hanging because this knight is pinned. So if I try to go here, my computer will make a noise. Right? And if I take, you can just take it with the queen. I, I still can't move my knight. Okay. And sign is castled. And von Bartleben went here. And he said, what? I learned chess from Ben Feingold. That's how old I am. And Ben Feingold said, get all your pieces out. So I got all my pieces out. Okay. And Steinitz played here. And von Barleben played here. And they traded all the pieces off. All, they traded everything. <clears throat> Not yet. Does this game look familiar yet? Or you got nothing? No? Is this a poor game best class? Plenty of nothing? Nothing's plenty for you? Do you have a car, Shruti? No. Okay, good. Then you're part of the song still. Okay, you have a mule? No. Good, you're, you're still doing well. Okay, now if black castles, let's say black castles here, yeah. who has the advantage, white or black? Black. Black, because everything is the same except white has this isolated pawn. Did black castle yet? No. Is it black's turn to move? No. No. So white played rookie one and said, you can castle now because I'm going to take your knight. And black said, no, I'm not going to do that. And Steinitz was thinking rookie five attacking the queen and then triple up on the bubble up. Queen e2, rookie one. That's a lot of pieces on the e file. Oh. And, and so he said, no, 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 you're, you're not going to do that. Breaking a very important rule. Never play f6. That rule wouldn't be invented for like 90 years. Queen e2, threatening mate. Queen d7, stopping mate. And now both players made a mistake. White needs to build up the pressure, but he played this boring move, and now black can escape with king f7. Breaking the pin on his knight, 
and then his knight can go here. And then he can put his rooks in the middle. There are a lot of children who are beginners who will never play king f7 because you have to castle. And I'm like, what if you have mate in one? No, I have to castle. We call those people my mom. If my mom doesn't castle, she resigns. She has to castle. That's, that's the way she feels about things. No grandmaster thinks like that, but a lot of lower rated players have to castle. If they don't castle, they, they resign. I can't, I, got, I can't play chess unless I castle. You should castle, but then when you shouldn't castle, then you shouldn't castle. All the rules get broken a lot. Here you should play king f7, and then you should play knight to d5, and then the position is equal. Instead, black played here, and now the knight is still pinned. Okay, and one of the reasons you never play f6 is you weaken this diagonal. And now we can put something on e6. If you could put one of these four pieces on e6, that's e6 by the way, which one would you put? If you could just put it right there. The queen. Not the knight. If you put the queen there, I'll take your queen. <coughs> All night? Yeah, now, now I would put this rook here. That's some good cheating. That's good, that's good cheating. Right. But yeah, if the knight was there, I don't think black's going to castle this game. Okay, so how do we get our knight there? Do we take our own pawn and then no. go here? No. Do we go here and give our knight away? No. So what do we do? We got to C4? Yeah, what you said. Say that again. Yeah, play d5. That's called a clearance sacrifice. And it's after Christmas, you should know the word clearance. Very important word. Okay, or you can watch the movie Airplane. Anybody? No, nothing? Come on, class. What's your clearance, Clarence? I don't know. What's your vector, Victor? Nothing? No. You see what the deal with you see at home? Okay. So on one of my videos, I was like, you at home, stop eating. I'm talking. And the guy was eating and he stopped. He put on my video. He's like, oh my. Oh, wait, he doesn't know I'm eating. Okay. But he, for a second, he stopped. He's like, wait a minute. All right, now knight takes is illegal. We call that one of our chess camp moves, probably the higher level class, because they know how the knight moves. Okay? But you can't do that. Queen takes should be illegal, because it hangs mate in one. So black played. C takes. C takes. And we played knight d4 as discussed. Now, one of the emotes Karen made can be played in this position with white, but it's not white's turn. What emote is that? Knight f5. Knight f5. If white plays knight f5, white will win. I guarantee it. You can't take with the knight, and if you take with the queen, you get mated on e7. So black played king f7 and said, no, don't, don't play knight f5. And silence is like, fine. So black had a better pawn structure, but black's king couldn't castle. And Steinitz made sure black couldn't castle by sacrificing a pawn. And now Steinitz wants to go here. And black said, D don't go there. And Steinitz said, no, I'm going to go there. And black said, all right, then we're going to play rook here. And I'm going to go here. And somebody's going to walk in the room and think that I castled. Shh, don't tell them I didn't. It looks like black castled, right? And Steinitz said, no, 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 no. No castling for you. Now, that, that move is really good, right? Yeah. Okay, so black played here, and white played discovered double, triple, quadruple check. Knight g5 check. Notice we're threatening queen takes queen, and we're threatening knight takes king. So black played... King e8. King e8. Okay, and now the most famous sequence of moves in chess history. Now you will recognize the game. No, nothing. It's the one where the rug comes out. Yeah, and then, oh, yeah, yeah, so you do recognize it, see? Yeah. yeah. The, the rest of you get a Latin dictionary and learn the term tabula rasa, okay? Okay. Good. Yeah, that's okay. So white played rook takes e7 check. Now if you take with the queen, now your, your rook's not defended so much, right? Yeah. So black, black's like, where'd my pieces go? And the answer is off the board. Yeah. So black shouldn't do that. Also, this is the worst move ever. That would be played in my chess camp. Okay. Okay. So the obvious move is king takes rook. And then if I turn the engine on, it wins all of black's pieces. <clears throat> which I could also do. 
Rook e1 check. If the king moves away from the queen, we take the queen, so the king stays near the queen. King d6 looks crazy, although it is the best move. If king d8, I check, and then I discover check. You guys agree that white's winning, right? Yes. Yeah, maybe you should castle next time. Okay, so king d6 is correct. And then uh, queen b4 check. King here allows mate, so that's not good. And after king c7, we check, and then we check, and then we take, and then if he takes back, it's mate. Okay. Anyway, it's, it's winning. So black played the strangest move you have ever seen. The only legal move I did not mention. King F8. King F8. Confusing the audience. Not you, because you know this. You're still a little confused. You're like, wait a minute. Okay. And the idea is black is threatening rook takes c1 mate, so white doesn't have time to take that queen. And so he checks again. Once again, king takes rook is illegal. King e8 hangs mate. And queen takes rook, loses all of your pieces. And queen. Okay. So he played. The only move I didn't look at. King g8. King g8. And then he did it again. And if you take the rook, I take your queen with check, and then I take all your pieces. If you play king f8, I play knight check, and I'm going to play queen takes queen check next to move, no matter what you do. So he played king h8. Check. Check. <clears throat> and now, uh, Von Bartolab, the guy with black, he got up and left. What did he win? No. Come on, I made this joke like ten times. Come on. What did he win? When he got up and left. Nothing. He won the Hikaru Nakamura Sportsmanship Award. <laughs> Come on. Okay, that's what he won. All right. Now, the reason he left was he was resigning, but instead of saying, I resign, good game, sir, that wasn't his, that's not how he behaved. That's how I behave. You, know, you lose, you lose. Did Kasparov do that too? Every game. He also, he's the, he started the award, but we ended after Hikaru for obvious reasons. Okay, so... What could have happened was this. Notice there's no h-pawn here, so it's check. Yeah. There was an h-pawn there before. And every move is check, and black, black gets checkmated. And then checkmate. Yeah, okay, and there's a lot of checkmates like that. Okay, and then uh, that was one of the greatest combinations ever played by a very, very suspicious world champion if you have an engine analyzes games. If you have engines today analyze the world champions games, they're not going to be a big fan of the guy who was white here. Probably they'll say he was the worst, right? Yeah, I think by far. I mean, not here. No, no, I mean in his life. Uh, I think by far, by far the worst. By, by a lot. Of all champions, you're saying Steinitz is the, the worst engine ranked? Oh, yeah. Somebody's done the analysis. Yeah, you know, I think it was like errors per thousand moves. Lasker and Kasparov and Morphy were like three, three to four, and he was like 30. Yeah, he's, yeah. Okay, but this game, he's like, I'm the world champion, although he might not have been, I think Lasker was. But they, you know, they, were both, they both played in this tournament too. They came in third and fifth, tough tournament. Okay, and this was like the greatest combination ever. Rookie seven and check. Okay, and the reason the combination works is this rook is trapped in the corner, I use style, and the king didn't castle, this king did castle, and white is using all of his pieces to attack. A lot of children and low-rated players, they're like, ooh, my queen, and then they move their queen every move. And they're like, I'm attacking with my queen. And Steinitz is like, I attack with all my pieces, I'm the world champion, okay? And then it works, okay? And that was a brilliant game. If you go to the internet, Type in Hastings 1895. All they talk about is this game. And there's a picture of the players. They all have like suit and tie and their beards are all making James Harden look bad. Yeah, the beards go down to the floor and out the door. Okay, that's how they looked back then. Okay, that was old school. Now, because of games like that, we learned. That's the problem a lot of you have. Is I show you a game and you're like, what? And then next week you're like, you showed me a game last week, huh? 
Okay. If you're playing somebody who starts quoting you games and quoting you games in the openings you're playing and you're like, what? Well, that's why they beat you. You're playing an opening. They know the opening better than you because they know what happened before. So if you want to get better at chess, you know what happened before. And some grandmasters, particularly Luke Winans in Belgium, when I lived in Belgium, when we were analyzing a lot of E4, E5 openings, he was like, in 1850, they played this way, but they were like, that's no good. Then in 18, and he was like, just give me the, the history of it. That's what you guys do, right? He's like, nowadays they go here. Now I can do that, but not like that. I can say they used to play here and that's no good. Okay, that's how you get better at chess is you see moves that are bad and then you stop playing them. And I've lost games in my life as, as a 2600 player where I did things that were already known that was bad, but I didn't know it. I'm not losing because I don't understand chess or understand principles. I'm losing because somebody already played the way that I lost before and my opponent knew it and I didn't. And I'm like, why is this losing? And they're like, they've known this for 20 years. There was the game, this guy versus this guy, and he won the same way I won. And I'm like, oh. So if I play an opening a lot, I try to look at the games that happened and not play the way the guys who lost before played them. So now, because black lost, and nobody plays d5 anymore. That's the culprit. Knight takes e4, people think that's fine for black. Okay, well, this was 1895, they didn't know that. They didn't go to my grandmaster lecture with the TV on the wall using the computer and turn the engine on. They should have done that. Okay, and another famous game that's much less famous comes from another opening where white wants to play c3, d4, but white doesn't want to go so slow. After c3, black can play a thousand legal moves. So black play, instead, white plays a very aggressive move, giving black no option. And I'll flip the board because my guy's black in this game. And this is called the Evans Gambit, named after your favorite grandmaster, Mr. Gambit. What's the Evans Gambit? What does white do? You! Before. Before what? Uh. Exactly. Okay. Or as Yasser would say, B2 to B4. I'd be like, oh yeah, that's right. And you're like, well, that loses a pawn. And you are correct. It does lose a pawn. And now when you play C3, you're attacking the bishop and D4. You wasted no time. And you're like, I don't need this pawn. That pawn was useless. Now I can play bishop a3 quicker. My pawn's not in the way. Okay? So it's the Evans Gambit. Very common in the 1800s. Grandmasters today prefer keeping their pawns so they don't play the Evans Gambit. With the notable exceptions, Kasparov beat Anand in a game. Ray Robson doesn't care about his pawns as much as other GMs. He'll play the Evans Gambit. And Hikaru won a game against Robert Hess. Okay. And there's some other games, but... In the 1800s, it was every game. Now it happens like once every four years because it loses a pawn and white has an isolated A pawn. Okay, my guy took the pawn and now white took back, right? Yes, no. I got both answers. Is anybody gonna say maybe? Yes would be a weird answer, Shruti, because it's illegal. It won't let me do it, Shruti. Yeah. Okay, so white castled, making that move legal. And did Black Castle? Can Black Castle now? No. No. Okay. So the guy with Black was like, let me move my knight out and then castle. Nobody plays knight e7 today because that move is very strange. And White's move was also very strange. He played the move e5. Also very strange. Okay. However, it's very good for under 1400 class because you get to learn a rule that you weren't so sure about. Normally... Karen would teach this rule in her second class today. What's the rule you're not so sure about? On passant. You're like, yeah, I know that. Leave me alone. I'm under 1,400. And white played on passant. And I was teaching a class in St. Louis before you were born, possibly before you two were born. And the, it was a beginner class. And I explained on passant. And one of the people in the class, they saw a pawn on the sixth rank and black played like c5 and they said can i take that on passant and i said no and they said but i want to 
<laughs> they wanted the rules to accommodate them. But I want to do that, so let me do that. I'm like, what? You want to do it? Okay. And he took. Now, when white sacrifices a pawn in a double king pawn opening, the usual reason is to get a lead in development. Black is wasting his time taking all the pawns, and white's getting all his pieces out. That didn't seem to happen this game. This seems like black has more pieces out than white. Okay, and then white's like, rawr, I am attacking. Now, when the lecture started, I told you what to do when they play knight g5 in double king pawn openings. Bishop what, c5? Is that what I told you, bishop c5? Ah, you're going even further back before knight g5. You're like bishop c5, they play knight g5, you take it. Yeah, you went back too far. Too far back in the lecture. You said castle. I said you should castle when they do that. And black castled. And white said, but I want to make more threats. So white played here, always retreat. Threatening the h-pawn. So both sides have castled. White has two pieces out and black has four pieces out and it's black's move. I don't think white's playing very well. Yeah. Okay, and black played here, developing another piece. Uh, but it loses a bishop. There's a knight here. Yeah. Right? Shame. All right. So they traded bishops. And white did something you've never heard of. Let's see. Make them complain and drink while they're complaining. A skewer! I've heard of that. That was very little complaining. So what move did white play? Bishop yeah. A3. Bishop a3. Bishop a3. That's a skewer. Okay, and black played queen g6, and white continued his capture. Black captured, white saved his bishop, and black took a pawn. And if you count the material, not something you're good at. By the way, if everybody answered this question, Raj, we get seven different answers in this class. And that's because I'm being nice. It'd probably be more than seven. I've given questions like this. I, I want the material disparity um, explained, and they can't put it in English. They can do it. Raj, can you do it? Can you explain the material in this situation? All right, I'll try. If you were like telling somebody what the material was like, you're explaining the game. I had a queen for a rook. How, what would you explain to them here? What would you tell them? Uh, white has a rook for... Shoot. Yeah, that's confusing. So we want to help him? Okay. Help him. For three pawns. Okay, so we want to help him? Because the white's an exchange up, but also down three pawns. Right. Black has a knight and three pawns yeah. for a rook. That's What's hard. better, a knight and three pawns or a rook? Probably the knight and three. Knight and three pawns. Now, what do I mean by that? Because most of you are confused, especially people who look really confused. If you took all the pieces off the board one by one, so if you see a piece for white, take it off for black. So we take off the queens. We take off the kings. We take off the pawns. We keep doing it one to one. We keep doing it. At the end, black will have a knight and three pawns, and white will have a rook. That's what's going to happen. So black has a knight and three pawns for a rook. Black's ahead. A knight and three pawns is better than a rook. Now, black has all his pieces out, and white has one. It's move 15. Why, 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 are, why are white's pieces here? Let's move 15. What's going on here? Okay, now, white did not necessarily agree with my analysis because I wasn't born yet. That was a good reason. So he said, that's too many pieces out. And he played here. Now we're talking, right? Now they're all lined up. Attacking the queen. Okay, and then he went here. Okay, now my favorite player was black. Paul Morphy. Paul Morphy. And Paul Morphy... He was like Brian Boitano, but I can't complete the joke. Anyway, uh, in this position, Paul Morphy made a Paul Morphy move. When you guys are attacking or doing things, you guys stare at a piece and go, ooh, that's shiny, and then you keep moving it. Okay, that, that's what White did. White thought this piece was shiny. <laughs> White moved that piece how many times? A lot. Right? How many? 20. <laughs> we're, we're on move 17. Three. Three? It had to move away, right? It had to come out from. Remember how it took this rook over here? Yeah. 
No, you, nobody can count that high? Six. Close. You're the closest without going over. Five. Yeah, you went over. Five, yeah. Played here, takes the rook, here, here, and here. So what, well, not there. That's the drunken one. So, so White thought his bishop was shiny and moved it five times. And Morphe's like, wow, I'm the best. I'm Morphe. Which piece did Morphe not move? The bishop. The bishop. The, the bishops moved like a million times. Went bishop here, bishop here, right the rook. So you play here attacking the queen. Now the rook's on an open file. That seems better than here. Yeah, okay, queen c2. Morphe's like, I'm, I'm Morphe. And the guy's like, I know, I know. And the guy went here. Okay, yeah, you guys have all seen this position before, especially you at home, because I've lectured on this position at least a hundred times. Yeah. Okay. And you guys have a lot of games memorized too. By the way, these games that I have memorized in these openings, I don't play these openings because I don't know them well enough. If I had dozens of games memorized, then I might play the opening. Now, there's a television station you never heard of because you're too young called HBO. And one of the shows on HBO is called Real Sports, okay? And one of the shows on Real Sports was a segment about Magnus Carlsen and Caruana and their match and the St. Louis Chess Club and so forth, mainly, and so forth. And they didn't talk to Magnus, they talked to Fabiano because the show's in the U.S. and we got to talk to the St. Louis Club and Fabiano and go Fabiano. Okay. And the woman who was interviewing uh, Fabiano, um, actually follow her on, on Twitter, she was like, uh, how much do you study chess? How do you study chess? What do you even do? And he's like, well, I look at chess games and, and stuff. And she says, how long do you do that? He goes, mm, 10 hours a day, just like you guys. And she's like, do you have chess games memorized? He says, I have about a million moves memorized. Is that what you guys did? No. Right. And that's why he's 2,800. Not because he was born 2,800. When he was born, he was like 2,700. Then he really worked hard. Okay. And does Fabiano know this game? Probably not, unless he's watched my lectures, then he does. Now Morphe made one of the greatest moves ever. He had the black pieces. What move did Morphe play? And the game ended. So what are the two best things in chess you can do? The best thing is... Checkmate. Checkmate. What's the second best? Take his queen. Take his queen. So he did both. If you do them both, and the guy can't stop both, then they usually resign. Yeah. Doesn't want to lose his queen. Doesn't want to get checkmated. Now, if you get a checkmate, you better stop king h1. What move stops king h1? Knight g3. Knight g3, and white resigned. Notice, I'm threatening your queen twice because I said so. And you're like, I don't care about threatening my queen. I care about knight here mate. You can stop both of them by resigning. Because then black can't get to move. Yeah. yeah. Like if you take the queen, the obvious move, checkmate. Okay. If you take the knight, which also stops mate, this wins your queen and this wins your queen. White decided that resigning was a good idea. Because he gets mated or loses his queen. Now, black is my favorite player and for many, many, many reasons. Paul Morphy. And one of the reasons is, in this game, which you all knew, black was giving a blindfold simul. He was playing two people at the same time, and he wasn't looking. And this was one of the games. That's how you play when you're giving a blindfold simul. Right, Trudy? No. Correct. Yeah. I showed this, I was teaching a camp for smart kids, okay? I know they were smart, you know how I know? Their parents said they were. Right. All the other kids, the parents were like, no, those, no only those kids, okay? These kids were, were chess smart, not actually smart. They were rated 1950 to 2300, and they were aged 8 to 13. It was a special camp for the strongest kids in the country. And I showed them this game, and nobody played knight g3, and they were looking. Morphy played knight g3, and he wasn't looking, and he was playing somebody else. Okay, And yet, 
people like Raj, if you can call him a person, he's like, Morphe's estimated reading, 2300. And I'm like, yeah, 2300 blindfold plays there. In a simul. And then I'm furious, and then he brings his computer with him to prove me wrong. <laughs> terrible. Yeah. And then he's like, more feats today would lose to, I gotta make a good name up here. I can't say that name. Uh, David Vest. Right? So according to you, if Dave Vest in his prime played Morphe in his prime, what's the score? Out of seven? Ten games. Ten. Exactly. He doesn't want to say because he'll, 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 he'll make me mad at him. Yeah. <laughs> Even he doesn't want to still be mad at himself. Yeah. I don't want to give Dave that many wins. Yeah. So you think it'll be six four Morphe? There's got to be a couple draws. What? No, I mean the score, the final score. The final score. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So a lot of the contemporary people are like Morphe. That was 150 years ago. He's no good. Now we're good, right? And I tell them in 1973 what happened. What happened? Anybody? No. 1973. Break your back, right? What? No, that's 72. Come on. 73. Who won the triple the you know the triple crown of horse racing? Come on. Secretariat. Secretariat, right? And to win the triple crown, you have to win all three races. The third one is the Belmont, which they still run. And in 73, Secretariat had a time, because that's the final time, and that time is still the record. And that time will always be the record. No matter what happens in the future. Nobody's going to beat that time. So people and horses and machines, things from a long time ago, they can still be good, even though contemporary people don't think so. They think LeBron is good because they never saw Will Chamberlain score 50 points a game for a season. They, every season, every game. They didn't see him because they never heard of him. Right, Trudy? Yes. You're like, well, you never heard LeBron James either. That's a different story. Okay, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Also, you're like, what? Yeah. So, Morphe was really good, even if Raj doesn't believe it. If I can convince him eventually, I have to have him throw his computer out. Okay, speaking of throwing your computer out, class dismissed.